So in this mini lecture, what I'd like to talk about are uh, five threats to statistical conclusion validity. So statistical conclusion validity refers to uh, whether or not uh, we have used our statistics properly and have drawn the right conclusions based on the numbers. It does not in any way speak to the methodology that got us there. And one of the challenges in, in research is that uh, there is a bias and there is a tendency to look for statistical findings and be, or excuse me, statistically significant findings and be happy when we get that significance. And that means we can get published. It means that, you know, we found something that was uh, uh, different by a rate greater than chance from, uh, from one group to the other. But it doesn't speak to the methods that were used to get those numbers. So this is at the very lowest level of did we use the numbers appropriately and make the right conclusions based on the numbers. From there we start to walk up into the methods of how we got the numbers and what assumptions we made or, or didn't make along the way. Um, so this is all that that speaks to. That's I think important because <coughs> we do tend to over focus on the fact that we get significant findings and we kind of uh, read the article and said, oh, well, these these were the significant pieces and kind of leave aside the fact that, well, maybe their methodology wasn't so solid in getting those numbers. So always remember that just because the numbers turned out significant doesn't necessarily mean it was a great study or great finding uh, because sometimes the numbers can come from uh, less than rigorous places. So uh, the, five th the five threats we'll talk about. Low statistical power, uh, violating the assumptions of the tests, uh, gone fishing and ex expanding our error rate, uh, low reliability measures and low reliability. So the first one, low statistical power. Uh, this comes from most often from the fact that we don't have a large enough sample size to see a particular sized effect. So if we're looking for um, a, a certain amount of improvement, say we're looking for a 10% improvement if in, in depression, we can figure out ahead of time, if we know uh, basically what the distribution of depression looks like, we can figure out how many people we need uh, to find an effect of 10%. So um, sometimes we do that, and sometimes we don't have an, uh, enough subject or enough sample to, uh, to draw the conclusions from the statistics that we want to. So my example here, uh, a little more concrete, so say we wanted to update our website with a single click checkout like, like Amazon has, and we're, we're thinking that that will improve customer satisfaction and maybe sales in some way. Uh, but we only tried in a pilot for, say, a week or two, and we don't see the effect and said, well, there was no difference. Well, you know what? If your product is good, or your market and your marketing is good, or vice versa, if your product's not that good, your marketing's not that good, it may take a fair bit of time to see that difference because it may only be a small difference. Um, the single click checkout, yeah, it's good. I get fewer people abandoning once they've looked at something, but it may take, uh, it, or excuse me, it may only contribute uh, a few sales out of every thousand. So in order to see that effect, which it may have an effect. But in order to see it, we might have to uh, test it for a longer period of time or, or uh, certainly along, uh, across more customers in order to see that it's there. So if we only did it for a short period of time and say 100 people view the site versus 10,000 people view the site, statistically we might say after 100, well, there was no difference from before and after. Versus at 10,000, we might say, yes, there was a difference that was statistically significant but uh, it was a small difference. So we missed it in the first case, we found it in the second, and it was all just a difference of the sample size that we had. Uh, the next one, uh, threat, violating the assumptions of statistical tests. So every test we do, if we do a correlation coefficient, if we do a t-test, has some basic assumptions. And one of those is that uh, the, the data we have, if we did a, a plot of it, looks like a bell curve, and that's called normally distributed. If we don't have data that's normally distributed, which is not all that uncommon, then we violated the assumptions of one of those tests. So when we violate that, the conclusions we can draw from that, that it is significant or not significant, um, become less certain. So we've added some error into our conclusions, and we can't say, well, we ran the test and it said it was statistically significant, so yes, we do have a difference here. The challenge is that when we violate that assumption, we don't necessarily know how much we've damaged that, uh, that conclusion. The good news here is <coughs> there are corrections for this. So if you look at, uh, at uh, t-tests, for example, 
uh, there's a test you can run that that comes you know fairly easily right along with uh, with the t-test that checks for uh, what's called homogeneity of variance, which essentially means that the two bell curves look about the same. They're about the same fatness or same skinniness and uh, look roughly similar so that you can say, hmm, I'm comparing uh, kind of similar pieces of information and they're different or not. There's a test for it and there's a correction for it. So if you uh, find out that, yeah, I have violated that, uh, that, uh, that assumption, most of the time there's a way to correct for it. So we have to know enough about our statistics to know when that, uh, well, one, to check and see if those assumptions are true, and two, then to correct it if we do have a problem. This one, uh, fishing in the error rate problem. Uh, most statistical tests, the kind of the, the standard of assumption is that to say something was found to be statistically significant says that there was uh, a 5% or less chance that that difference is due to chance. So the difference we see is big enough to say, you know what, that's not a chance variation. It's caused by something else. It's non-random. And so that is kind of the, the just approved standard or the, the commonly used standard for how we think about uh, statistical significance. Within that, though, there is that always 5% chance that what we found was due to chance. And the fun part is, every time you run another statistical test, you have a 5% chance. So if I do two correlations, and they each are at a uh, you know, 0.05 or 5% probability of finding a significant uh, finding due to chance, well, I've done two of them, now I have a 10%. I've done three of them, now I have a 15%. That one of them if it's significant, is due to random error and not to the effect that I'm, I'm seeing, or I'm saying it is. So I had a client one time, and it was a market research piece about uh, toothpaste. We were looking at characteristics of toothpaste, and we did a thousand correlations. I didn't want to. I said, that's a bad idea, uh, and explained, you know, a thousand times 0.5 percent, that's 50 correlations that are likely to be found significant just due to chance. She said, I don't care. Let's do it anyway. Okie dokie. And we found, about, we found 63 correlations that were significant. Now here's the thing. There's no way to tell which of those 63, out of those 63, which of them were due to chance and which of them were real. So we had a whole bunch of information that we really could not draw a solid conclusion about because, well, let's see, uh, 50 of those are likely to be due to chance. I have 63. That means four-fifths of the ones that I found that are significant are likely just due to, to, to chance variation. What should I? What conclusion should I draw from this finding and from this research? And the answer is very, very few. So uh, we we had a bit of a roundabout on uh, on trying to explain that uh, to the client, and it took took some effort, and we had to kind of go back and, and try some some different approaches that were a little more sophisticated than just taking uh, the the base level uh, correlation coefficients. So what you should remember is. Every time you add another test, so if you do another t-test or another correlation within your study, you're putting a little bit more chance in there, 5% more chance that something you find is going to be due to random variation. 